Good morning. It's uh, so good to see everybody here today. I want to welcome you to uh, Grace Baptist Church. Um, if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn with me to Psalm chapter 16. That's uh, the passage we will read today as our morning reading. Psalm chapter 16. And as you're turning to Psalm 16, I want to tell you two things. One, we started Wednesday night back this past Wednesday night, and it was wonderful. I, um, I'm so uh, so glad to be starting it back and and uh, kind of getting back to a little normalcy. And so very very glad for those of you who are here. If, if you didn't come, that's okay too. We you're more than welcome to come this Wednesday night. We started. Um, studying the Sermon on the Mount. So that's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. This is the sermon that Jesus preached, uh, the only sermon that we have record of that he preached. And so that's what we're doing on Wednesday night. So hopefully that'll be, uh, that'll be good. And the other thing that I want to uh, make mention to you about is uh, Mr. and Miss Betty, uh, Miss, Mr. Buddy and Miss Betty. Uh, they had a really good night last night. Uh, a text back and forth with her this morning. Uh, it's just t- kind of touch and go uh, right now. Uh, some good days and some bad days. So continue to pray for them, please. And uh, for those of you who sent messages to her or called her, thank you so much for doing that. I talked to her this week, and she said that's, that's been a highlight of her week. Um, and so it, it, just keep on doing that, okay? Being in a hospital room or a place that's not your home for that long, uh, it's, it's emotionally taxing. So... Um, Thank you for reaching out to her, and we'll continue to pray for them today, okay? Uh, Psalm 16 will be what we read today, and uh, then I'll pray, and uh, then our ladies will come uh, lead us in, in the song part of our service. This is Psalm 16. Hear now the reading of God's Word. A miktam of David. Preserve me, O God. For in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. The drink offerings of blood I will not pour out and, or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because He is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen and amen. Let's pray together on this Lord's Day. Father, we thank You for this day. We know that it is a day that You have made. And so we want to rejoice and be glad in this day. Father, we ask that You would preserve us. That You would cause us to endure in faith and in hope. For it is to You that we run and it's in You that we take refuge. Father, on behalf of everybody here today, I I want to confess to You that we have nothing good apart from You. We know that every good and perfect gift comes from Your hand. Thank You for being our portion, our lot in life. Thank You for the wonderful promised inheritance of the new heavens and the new earth that You've given us in the Gospel It is to you on this Lord's day that we come looking for counsel. We want you to instruct our hearts so that we know the right way to live 
and to be and to think. Steady our faith so that we will not be shaken. Make our hearts glad and our whole being rejoice because we are secure in your Son, Jesus Christ. Make known to us your way of life. And Father, give us the grace of being in your presence and having joy. Father, we thank you for the Neal family, we pray that you would touch them this morning, that you would comfort them where they are, that you would enliven them and strengthen them to persevere. Bring them home safely to us, Lord. That's our prayer. And we make these requests in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church family. If you would please stand with us and we will sing Great and Mighty twice through. Thou art worthy, one time through. firm a foundation. We'll sing just verse 1 and verse 4. Should endeavor to 
Amen, amen. I hope you have a Bible with you today. If you do, take it out with me, please, and turn to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua, uh, chapter 21. Joshua, chapter 21. And I'm going to read verses 43, 44, and 45. Joshua, chapter 21, verses 43, 44, and 45. Now, as we look at the book of Joshua, there are three words that will summarize this book for us. The first word is the word war, the second word is the word land, and the third word is the word covenant. So, war, land, and covenant. Let's pray together, and we will ask the Lord to bless the reading of His word and the preaching of it also. And then I'll read Joshua 21. Let's pray. Father, it is to your word that we have come this morning looking for insight, looking for understanding, looking to know what you require of us. So as we read these verses here and we consider this book of Joshua, we ask that you would incline our heart to your testimonies. We ask that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word and that you would satisfy our hearts with the truth. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Joshua chapter 21. Verses 43, 44, and 45. Hear now the reading of God's Word. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that He swore to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it, and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as He had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them. For the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. Amen. And amen. May God bless the reading of His holy word on this Lord's day. And may He add His benefit to the preaching of it. Those last four words are monumental words. Look at them again. All came to pass. How many of you know this morning that the Lord is faithful to fulfill His promises? We have come to believe the gospel, haven't we? We've come to trust the incarnation of Jesus, the work of Jesus, the attainment of perfection according to the law that Jesus rendered. We've come to to believe that. We've come to believe that Jesus went to the cross and died for our imperfection, our sin. We've come to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and therefore He has conquered death and sin and the grave. We have come to believe that Jesus ascended to heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of God. He's interceding for us now. 
He's preserving us, extending constant grace to us. He has fulfilled all of these things for us. Yet, there is one last thing that He has not yet fulfilled. And that is, He has not returned to the earth. He has not yet returned to the earth established His eternal rule and eradicated sin and death forever as promised in Revelation 21 and 22. So we are people today who have come to hope because of the things that He has done in the past, but yet we're still hoping for something in the future. We're hoping to say with Joshua 21 verse 45, that four word phrase, all came to pass. We sing that old hymn, what a day that will be, when my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon His face and see the one who died for me because of His grace. That's the hope of this life. We have no other hope, as Psalm 16 told us. We have no other goodness in this life. We come now to the end of our six-week journey. We started in the book of Genesis, and now we're stopping here in Joshua. We're coming to the climax, the grand finale And you remember, there's one main idea that governs these six books. And that main idea is that God has chosen Israel. And God has saved Israel from Egypt to be His treasured possession. So they have to leave Egypt because of God's choice and because of God's salvation. They must leave Egypt behind and they must travel through the wilderness But they're traveling to something. What are they traveling to? The promised land. Look at verse 45 again. All came to pass. Do you see how this working definition of these six books now comes to fulfillment? God has saved them. God has instituted the law. He's established the tabernacle. He's given them the priesthood. He's given them all of this grace. But there's one thing left yet unfulfilled. And that is the land. He's not yet given them the land. But here in the book of Joshua, they finally get it too. And the conclusion of Genesis to Joshua and the conclusion of the book of Joshua is all came to pass. Ain't that just like God? To fulfill His Word. To keep His promises. Can I just say to you today, God has never given you any reason to doubt Him. And yet we do. You see, these six books have everything to do with you and me. Because as God chose and saved Israel, so too God has chosen us in Christ. He has saved us in Christ to be His treasured possession. We are like them in that we must leave our Egypt. We must leave the idolatrous world and the selfishness of the world behind. We must move through the wilderness which we currently are moving through right now. The wilderness of temptation and doubt and fear and anxiety. We must move through that. But brothers and sisters, we're moving to something. We're moving to the promised land. Not a piece, a strip of land in the Middle East. But we're moving toward that grand finale in Revelation 21 and 22. Where God will dwell with us forever. And there will be no sin in this world. No sin in me and no sin in you. And therefore no sin in the world. 
Now, what is God doing in Joshua? That's the question. In the book of Joshua, God fulfilled His word, but in so doing, He showed His people how to serve Him. The book of Joshua is a manual for you and me as believers. It's a manual that describes how we should serve Him. Serve Him in three ways. Number one, in war. Number two, in land. And number three, in covenant. So let's look at the first one. How do we serve God in war? You say, well, we're not at war. Yes, you are. There's not a war taking place between your AR-15 and my AR-15. Not between your weapons and my weapons. There's a war in which you are engaged and this war is in between your ears. Now, when we look at the book of Joshua, we see that the war is physical combat. But brothers and sisters, it's directly applicable to you and me who are not in physical combat today because there is a war. Will we believe God or will we not believe God? That's the war and that war is being waged in between your ears. So make no mistake, you're in war today. And it's the battle for your mind. In chapters 1 through 12, we see two wars, or two battles, I should say. The larger war is fulfilled in chapter 21, but there's two battles. On one hand, there's the battle at Jericho. Everybody remembers Jericho battle, right? They march around the walls, and the walls come a what? Tumbling down. See, you went to vacation Bible school. I'm so proud of you. But there's another war in these 12 chapters. There's a war at Jericho, and everybody remembers that war. But do you remember the war at Ai? Of course you don't. Because no one talks about that. But when the author of the book of Joshua wrote the first 12 chapters, he gave you a positive war where they won, and he gave you a negative war where they lost. And they must be read together to understand the differences in victory and defeat. Now in chapter 1, if you'll notice with me verses 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, God commissions Joshua. Read with me verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, Joshua. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you, Joshua. I will not forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on this book of the law day and night, so that you may be careful to do all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God repeats this to Joshua in chapter 1. But if you remember, God told Moses the same thing in Deuteronomy 31. Now this word here stands as a call for Joshua, but it's also assurance for Joshua to move forward in the promises of God. Joshua's name in Hebrew is Yeshua. Yeshua is actually Jesus' Hebrew name. 
So as Joshua is leading the people in the land, so too your Joshua and my Joshua, Jesus the Christ, will lead us into the land. And he had no fear. And he was courageous. And he meditated on the law of God to do it for us in our place. So now this call stands as a call for the second generation. For all those who are under 20 who are now over 20 years old. To go in and to dispossess this land. So there's two battles. The first battle is the battle of Jericho. The second battle in this war is the battle at Ai. There are three things that take place in the battle of Jericho that do not take place at Ai. In Jericho, they won because of these three things. At Ai, they lost because they didn't do these three things. Here's the first thing. The first thing is they followed the Ark of the Covenant. Look at chapter 3, verses 2, 3, and 4. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priest, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. You there, yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near the ark in order that you may know the way you are to go, for you have not passed this way before. So in order for them to engage in and secure victory in this battle with Jericho, the ark must lead them. They must follow the ark. The ark has to be central to all they do. Now, what in the world does that have to do with you and me? The law of God was in the ark. On top of the ark was the mercy seat. The priests would put blood on the mercy seat so that when God looked down and saw the broken law, He would see the blood. And when He saw the blood, He would pass over the sins of the people. Brothers and sisters, the true Ark of the Covenant is Jesus Christ. He is the sacrifice. He is the atonement. He is the mercy seat who covers us. So if we are going to advance in this war that's in between our ears, we must follow our Ark of the Covenant who is Jesus the Christ. The second thing they had was that they memorialized Events. Look at chapter 4, verse 2. Take twelve men from the people, from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly. Bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of the Jordan and take each of you a stone upon his shoulder. According to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, verse 6, and this is important, I would underline a circle, verse 6, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. The ark goes into the Jordan River. The Jordan River stops on both sides. Is it a miracle? You bet your hind in it is. And what comes up in the middle of the Jordan? Dry land. And the people pass through on dry land. Does this sound eerily similar to anything else? The people pass through the Red Sea in Exodus 13 through 15. On what? On dry land. Does it sound like anything in the creation story? Day two of creation. There was water over the face of the deep and God made dry land come up. Do you see the pattern emerging through your Bible? 
that God has the ability to superintend due to His sovereignty the natural order of things. Created order itself. But you take these stones because these stones came from the bottom of the Jordan where only God could part the water so you could see the bottom. You take these stones because these stones are memorials for you. They are for you to remember that God did a miracle for you. And when your kids ask, and isn't it ironic how we're always talking about the kids? The responsibility of the parent is to teach the whom? The kid. When your kids ask, you're able to tell them these stones are a memorial where God delivered us. They saved us. Brothers and sisters, do you realize that we also have memorial events today? We don't have the stones of that time, but we do have the stone that the builders rejected. His name is Jesus, and He told us to baptize one another. He told us to take the Lord's Supper with one another. He told us to give ourselves to the preaching of the Word together. He has given us memorials. And as we're working through and taking the promised land, we're at war in between our minds. We need to follow our ark. That's Jesus Christ. But we also need these memorials, the preaching and the baptism and the Lord's Supper to remember the great sign of God's deliverance in our lives. The third thing that they had in this war with Jericho is that they celebrated Passover. Look at chapter 5, verse 9. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of this place is called Gilgal to this day. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. They celebrated the Passover. Brothers and sisters, you do realize that when Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he said, Jesus Christ is our Passover. When we follow the ark, that's Jesus. And we have these memorial events, preaching and baptism and Lord's Supper. We will celebrate the great Passover of the Lord Christ. And that's how we are successful in battle. This is mental. It's in between your ears. Now we turn our attention away from the walls come a-tumbling down to Ai. And chapter 7 verse 1 describes the battle in its totality. In chapter 7, verse 1, But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. In the midst of this holy war, we have just defeated Jericho by following the ark, by these memorialized events, by celebrating the Passover. And as soon as we defeat Jericho, we turn our eyes toward Ai. And as we're looking toward Ai, there's a shiny object to our left. And it's the idols of the land. And our hearts Go after them. In the midst of this holy war, the people of God broke covenant with God. And they did this by clinging to worldly enticements. Everybody look up here just for a moment. You come in on Sunday morning, you want your faith renewed, hopefully, prayerfully, you leave, and you feel like the Hulk. That's what I hope you feel like when you leave. You feel encouraged and full. And then as soon as you go out, you go out into the what? The world. And there are people out there that don't believe like you. And there are events out there that are outside of your control. There is evil that is actually in the world. And these people and these events and these circumstances mount on you. And it distracts you from the feeling that you got on Sunday morning. 
Even though you're in a holy war and the war is right here and you know that because your preacher told you that and you go out into the world and you see a shiny object and you're enticed to fear. You're enticed to doubt. You're enticed to anxiety. You're enticed to worry. You're enticed to lust. You're enticed to anger. You're enticed. That is chapter 7. Their love for the present world overshadowed their love for God. Isn't that our testimony? Isn't that what we are guilty of? That often, too often, too often, preacher first on the list, too often, events, circumstances, and people eclipse God from my eyes. And I forget Him, and I forget His promises, and I forget what Christ has done, and I look at evil, I look at the world, and I fear, or I'm anxious, or I'm angry. Isn't that our dilemma too? Of course it is. Because the battle is in your mind. So now what do the people do? AI defeats them. They're defeated. They're in the wilderness and they're beat by some unknown army. What do we do? Go back to Egypt? Just, just let's forsake it all? No. What you do when you fail really tells the world what you believe. Did you catch that? What you do when you fail really tells the world what you believe. Look in chapter 8 at what they do. Chapter 8, verse 33. All Israel, sojourner as well as native born, with the elders and the officers and the judges, they stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priest who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, half of them in front of one mountain, half in front of another mountain, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded them at first to bless the people of Israel. Verse 34, And afterward, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse. Deuteronomy 28. Do you see it? According to all that he wrote. The people failed. They failed to follow the ark. They failed to remember and to celebrate the Passover. So what must they do now? They must return to the Lord. They must renew the covenant with Him because this covenant was to be the centerpiece of their lives. May I just say to you that we also have a covenant that should be the centerpiece of our lives and it is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 34 tells us though that these people live their lives under the Word of God. May I just say to you today that you're in a war. Whether you wanted to be in one when you came in or not, I cannot help you there. But you are in a war and it is in between your ears. And whether you win this war or you lose this war determines, is determined by how you think. With the Word of God. The second thing is, how do we serve the Lord in the land? The land. By the way, chapters 13-21 through 21 is a testimony of God's faithfulness. But as these chapters are testifying to the faithfulness of God, they are simultaneously showing the faithlessness of the people. What you see here is how the land is distributed. God commissions him to distribute this land. Now, really quickly, you're going to have to go quick. I'm going to go quick. I want you to look at Joshua chapter 1, verse 13. 1 13. Ready? Remember the word that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and giving you this land. Look at chapter 1 verse 15. Until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as He has to you. Look at chapter 11 verse 23. 
11, 23. So Joshua took the whole land according to all the Lord had spoken to Moses. And Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments. And the land had rest from war. Look at chapter 14, verse 15. Now the name of Hebron, formerly, and the land had rest from war. Look at chapter 21, verse 44. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as He sworn to their fathers. Look at chapter 22, verse 4. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as He promised them. Look at chapter 23, verse 1. A long time after, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all the surrounding enemies. Brothers and sisters, do you see what God did? The whole book all came to pass. What, what's the promise? The promise is the land. But what will you experience in the land? Rest. Do you see? Rest. Do you remember Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2? God created in six days, but on the seventh day, God what? He rested. And He invited man into that rest. Spiritual rest. Physical rest. Social rest. Emotional rest. But man said in chapter 3 of Genesis, I don't want what you're offering. I would rather be my own God. I can secure rest for myself. And they got us in this mess we're in right now. Does your life characterize rest? Or do you have problems in your life? Have you ever had a problem in your life? Do y'all need more coffee? What's wrong with you? No! I've got problems! And people in my life are problems. Circumstances happen. That's problems. I don't have rest. Jesus comes in Matthew chapter 11 and He says, Come unto Me, all you are heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Rest. Why in the world did Jesus have to say that if God gave rest in Joshua? I'm so glad you asked that. You ready? Real quick, look at chapter 3, verse 10. And Joshua said, Here is how you should know the living God is among us, and that He will without fail drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, Jezebites. Look at chapter 13, verse 6. All the inhabitants of the hill country, I myself will drive them out from before the people of Israel. This is what God promised. Now look at chapter 13, verse 13. Yet the people of Israel did not drive out the Girgashites or the Maccathites, but they let them dwell there. Look at chapter 15, verse 63. But the Jesubites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people of Judah could not drive out. So the Jebusites dwell with the people of Israel or Judah at Jerusalem to this day. Look at chapter 16, verse 10. However, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have not been but have been made to do forced labor. Look at chapter 17, verse 13. Now when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not utterly drive them out. Look at chapter 23, verse 13. Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but these nations will be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish off of the good ground that the Lord God has given you. 
See, these chapters show us God's intention was rest. I will drive them out, but I'm going to use you to do it. And the people were not faithful. The people chose to lean on their own understanding. And they looked at these inhabitants as slaves, forced labor, instead of utterly driving them out. The reason that Jesus has to come and the reason that Jesus has to say, come to me and I'll give you rest is because Jesus is the only one that can drive sin and death fully out of this world and establish peace and hope forever. So Jesus says to you this morning, come to me if you're heavy laden. If you don't have any rest, come to me. I will give you rest. And we're hoping for, waiting for that day when He returns where 2145 becomes true of us. All came to pass. So now, they're in the land. They had rest. But they weren't fully obedient to God. They weren't faithful to Him. So now what? The third thing is covenant. They must live in covenant with God. The people must renew this covenant with God. Look at chapter 23, verses 1 and 2. A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies... And Joshua was old and well advanced. Joshua summoned all Israel. How much of Israel? All Israel. Its elders, its heads, its judges, its officers. And he said to them, I'm now old and well advanced in years. So here's his point to them in chapter 23. Be faithful to God because God has been faithful to you. So they have this little ceremony where the people say, oh yes, we will be faithful to God. It's in chapter 24. It begins in verse 14. Read with me there. Now therefore fear the Lord. Serve Him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt. And serve the Lord. If it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your fathers or the gods of the Amorites. But as for me and my house, we will what? We're going to write it on a plaque, put it on a shawl, put it on a t-shirt and wear it around like we mean it. That verse right there is quoted so much. I mean, my goodness. I want you to listen to the absolute audacious hypocrisy of the people in the next verse. Verse 16. Then the people answered, Oh, 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 a bunch of Baptists is what this is. Oh, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us up and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He's the one who did great things in our sight and He preserved us all the way and all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove these people out. The Amorites lived in the land. Therefore we will serve the Lord. He is our Lord. So Joshua looks at them in verse 19. He says, you are not able to serve the Lord. Nobody puts that on their placard, by the way. Nobody puts that on their t-shirt. Nobody puts that on their bumper sticker. Joshua's response to them is, you can't serve Him. You're not able to serve Him. Look at it. You're not able to serve Him. He's holy. You're not. He's jealous because you're not faithful. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and you serve foreign gods, then He'll turn and do you harm and consume you. This is Deuteronomy 28, by the way. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. It's like an extended altar call in a Baptist revival. Verse 22, Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourself today that you have chosen the Lord to serve Him. And they said, Oh, we are witnesses. Oh, we are witnesses. And he said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, Oh, the Lord our God, we will serve and we will obey His voice. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day. And he put it in place statutes and rules at Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words, verse 26, look at it. Verse 26, in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and he set it up under the terebinth that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. 
And Joshua said to all these people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us. For this stone has heard all the words the Lord has spoken to us. Therefore, this stone shall be the witness against you, lest you deal falsely with God. When Jesus came, He's riding into Jerusalem on that last week of His life. These people's descendants are in the crowd. People are shouting at Jesus, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. These people's descendants look at Jesus and say, Tell them to shut up. And Jesus says, If they stop praising Me, the stones will. You see, if they knew the book of Joshua, they would have known the covenant that they entered into. And they would have known that that was a strike against their hypocrisy. The reason Jesus came is because these people failed. And Jesus fulfilled and now Jesus, as our Yeshua, can get us there. Praise God. Praise God. Now, how do we apply Joshua? Just two ideas. Number one, take your mind captive. Your mind belongs to you. Your mind is a terrible thing to waste. Your mind is a terrible thing to give to someone else so they waste it. You are responsible for your mind. Ultimately, what happens in your life is a result of what takes place in your mind. You can't detach what you believe from how you behave. You see the example of these people in Jericho. They believed the Lord and they won. You see the example of these people in Ai. They did not believe the Lord. They leaned on their own understanding and they lost. Let me throw out a few verses for you. You ready? 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. The apostle writes and he says, to the, to the Christian church at Corinth, we do not wage war. Interesting language. Wouldn't you say? We do not wage war like the world wages war. The world wages war by the flesh. We wage war with the Spirit. And the weapons of our warfare have the ability to pull down strongholds. That stronghold is not a reference to the walls of Jericho. It's a reference to the walls in your mind. Therefore, he says, we take every thought captive to Christ. Here's another verse for you. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that you must renew your mind so that you will be able to discern God's will. You can't know God's will with an unrenewed mind. And while it is the Spirit of God that initially regenerates you, saves you, and gives you a new mind, you are a part of the process moving forward as you're moving through the wilderness to the promised land. In that regard, you do cooperate with the Spirit of God to take your mind captive. It's your mind and it's a terrible thing to waste. 
The second application and last application is this. Renew your commitment to the Lord daily. Renew your commitment to the Lord daily. Now I want to tell you what I mean and what I don't mean. I don't mean you come to church seven days a week. Because I'm not going to be here either. I'm not telling you to be baptized 85 times in your life. I'm not telling you that. But I am telling you on a daily basis, your mind has to be given to the truth. You must give your mind to the truth. And brothers and sisters, the only truth that we have is the book that's in your lap. You say, oh, no, oh, Kevin, that's legalistic. It's legalistic. I'm not a, I'm not a legalist. I'm not going to follow these rules. Let me ask you a question. How often every day do you get on book face? That's Facebook for those of you who are slow. How often do you get on Twitter and intra, uh, Instagram and Pinterest and, and, and all the rest of that nonsense? You're giving your mind to something already. And here your preacher, the lover of your soul, the one who cares for you, says, you need to renew your mind with the Scripture every day. And you go, nah, that's legalistic. I'm not going to do that. No. No, 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 no. You're in a war. You're in a war. And many of you are losing. You're losing to fear and anxiety and worry and doubt and anger and unforgiveness and bitterness and lust. You're losing. And why? Because there's not a regular renewal of your commitment to the Lord. Where you say, my mind will not be given to people with dirty feet so they can walk through my mind. How often are you allowing people with dirty feet to walk through your mind? You're just listening to it, lapping it up. But, but Kevin, I like Tucker Carlson. It's all the same. It's all the same. People have this dirt on their feet. They're walking through your mind. And you know what happens to you? You begin to think like they think. Because they plant little statements in your head and you just replay those statements instead of the promises of God. And so you begin to think like the people around you instead of thinking like God demands you think. It's your mind. It's your war. I'm just here to help you. Renew your commitment to Him daily. I'm going to close with this. Your mind is like a garden. Whatever you plant in your mind, whatever you fertilize in your mind, whatever you nurture in your mind will bring you a harvest. Your harvest is the way you live. You are not living on accident. You may have been negligent to this point, but you're not living on accident. The way you're living is a direct response to the way you're thinking. What are you planting in your mind? Or what are you allowing other people to plant in your mind? Take your mind captive. That's the only way to victory. May God bless the preaching of His Word. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we, we ask for forgiveness and we're reminded of how much Jesus has forgiven us. How quickly we're distracted. We thank 
you this morning for the reminder that we're headed to the promised land, but we, we're still in this wilderness, Lord. Help us as your people to take our minds captive, to renew our minds on a daily basis, to believe, to hope, to trust, to faith, to lean. Oh God, invigorate faith in our hearts. Strengthen and fortify faith in us so that we can persevere to the real promised land. Bless these sweet ones this morning with Your grace. Be tender to them, Lord. Kind to them as You lead them and teach them. And I pray these things for Jesus' glory. Amen and amen.